<laughs> Hello everyone. Sorry, Baz and Toffee TV just come in and just fucking dropped absolute nonsense bombshells <laughs> in the room and then walked off. Um apparently love pull a shite. Uh, yeah, funny that. Um they only had ten men, Chris. I mean, oh, not like Liverpool. We I've got no experience of seeing Liverpool play with ten men this season. I'm being good with it. They were but it suited them to go down to ten literally, men anyway. Yeah, literally. Best thing that ever happened to Sean Dyche. Um, right, Paul Machen, Chris Page, at Chloe Boxing, Dan Club, and probably when he comes back from the toilet, Barry Cass, um, to talk uh, on this week's Red Men Originals podcast about the Merseyside derby. Uh, and then we're going to do some bits and pieces around that in part two as well. Um, but yes, Chris, another day, another derby, another brand new way of breaking Evertonian hearts. That's what Merseyside derbies are for, right? Yeah, well, I was... Lucky enough to sit next to your dad during the game and he turns around the, uh, straight after the Canate thing. I was like, they'll be talking about that for 20 years. <laughs> and I was laughing my head off because I know that Baz has already written it down somewhere. In fact, someone might be getting <laughs> tattooed with it in there right now. The you big, never know. The big book of Everton injustices. <laughs> Was <laughs> <laughs> was VAR was absolutely fine. There was nothing wrong with VAR. The referee was awful. Excellent, the, strong officiating. <laughs> Um, <laughs> finally, think that's not the fair. Like, my brother said this to me yesterday. He's like, VAR, I'm like, actually, VAR got everything right. Yeah, yeah, they actually did it in the game. The referee yeah. made a terrible decision not yeah, to yeah. send Kanata, but that's not the VAR. Mm. They can't, even when they're having a go, they get they, they have a go with the wrong thing because they're angry. Yeah, it's glorious. And just to clarify, this whole replay thing, like, ha ha ha, it's a funny joke. It's a bit like the B sharps thing. If it gets less funny, the more you hear it. Mm. Um, like, it's not the same. These two think these two things are not anyway, whatever. Um But my daughter does this though, like, you know, she she wants to be like the class clown and stuff like that. So she'll choke on her food and we'll laugh. And then she'll try and choke on her food. It's like it's not funny the second time, Lara. Yeah, yeah. To cry for help. <laughs> 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 or she doesn't like the or it's a it's a it's a it's it's protest against your food. Trying to choke on your food. Yeah. Um but yeah, look ultimately boss you know I, I don't know how it doesn't really compete because it's not up there with Curtis Jones winners or you know Shakiri goals or you know Christ Divock Origi um, but it's just lovely beating them and we never seem to do it in a truly straightforward way and I'll be honest they are crying about that Canata thing we'll come on to that but I like the, I, I like the fact that there's always a new thing that they've got to be upset about now Jordan Pickford talking about like the, the officiating how you always get the decisions shut up Jordan Pickford you beaut um, it's just I, I, it makes it more enjoyable for me it does and it's, it's always going to make it more enjoyable isn't it something had to make that game enjoyable didn't it because it wasn't it wasn't a spectacle as such was it um, it was a bit of a difficult watch I don't think Liverpool really got out of second gear I don't think Liverpool really needed to get out of second gear and you know as you mentioned sort of a little bit earlier Sean Dice would probably you could hang his hat on that sending off. It's something to go and get the team around and try and, you know, get them together to go and, you know, prove everybody wrong and all that type of stuff. But as far as the game was going, we were well the better side anyway. I thought it made it harder for us to go on and get the victory when they went down to 10 men. But ultimately, we did our job. That's four home wins out of four games in the Premier League so far this season. You know, two goals conceded, I think it is. That's that's a good start to the season for us. And we're making Anfield a fortress again on the sly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Chloe, I want to talk about your pre-match nerves. Um, you weren't in a good place when we were driving to Anfield. Or when we were walking to Anfield. <laughs> or walking to Anfield. When we were having Anfield. a drink when, before the game hmm, started. When you got into Anfield. At what point did those nerves... Was it us scoring the penalty? When they put Michael Keane on the pitch, I thought, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I was like, you know what, lads? Five at the back is actually a really great decision. But when you're having to bring on Michael Keane to do that, it almost contradicts how good of a decision it is. Uh, as soon as I saw him step on the pitch, I knew he was going to do something. And he decided to play basketball in the box, gave us a penalty. Uh, and that was wonderful for me. I did... Being truthful though, it was when we got the second goal and I finally didn't feel ill. <laughs> um, because I was like, at around 60, it, it wasn't nerves, it was disappointment. It was a case of, like, they've been down to 10 men here for this long. We're much better than that, absolutely crap. Anything but three points is is 
awful. And then when we went one 0 up, it was we've actually got something to lose here. Let me worry about that as well. <laughs> so the the worry just changed. Um, and he did absolutely not in all game. And I, I, their Twitter. I'm so proud of of the lads. They what I don't know what of. I don't know what you saw that made you proud because I could not imagine having to watch them week in week out and if, try and support them. They were horrific. If you ever want to know what like gaslighting is, it's Evertonians taking positives from their football matches <laughs> is being told that there's some heroic purpose behind everything that they're suffering um, yeah uh, Dan it, yeah all, all, all that has been discussed so far um, it was I mean like I said to Chloe on the, on the walk you know you were saying it's cold and I'm nervous and I said it's quite mild and it's Everton <laughs> um, so you know Yes, it was a bit more of a problem. It was harder work than I think we would have liked. I agree. I think the 10 men thing actually did play into their hands because it meant they didn't have to try and make a game of it. Yeah. Um, and that probably made it therefore harder for us to break it down. But I don't know about you. I never I never felt like we weren't going to win that game. No, not necessarily. I was a bit with Chloe in sort of the morning. You always get that sort of derby belly because it does mean a little bit more. Albeit Everton, their terrible side, we have a very good side. If it was any other sort of mid to lower table Premier League team at Anfield, regardless of the kickoff time, we just expect it to be quite a straightforward win. But the derby factor and the fact that they'd love nothing more than to take something, anything from us, does sort of add to it a little bit and add to those sort of those pre match nerves and anxiety and whatever. But yeah, overall it was relatively straightforward. Never really felt like with any danger of losing the game necessarily. Obviously had the one big chance of the doors with Calvert Living, which he might expect to do better with. Like that sort of as a moment in time for Everton and Sean Dice, they'll look back at that and go, if we just get that, because all of a sudden then they put all men behind the ball earlier than they do anyway, and you never know how the game pans out there. But my sort of overriding feeling from the entire game was that going out to 10 men was a blessing in disguise for them. Yeah. Because every time they attacked us and we nicked the ball yeah. back, we were just red arrows time at them. And it felt like a matter of time before we took the lead via a counter-attack because it was four on three numerous times. And a couple of times we get the pass wrong or the wrong decision or the weight or whatever it may be. And there's one moment we get it right and actually Young gets back and we felt, wow, he's still on the pitch. Makes a brilliant last-ditch tackle. Zanaya. So it felt like whilst Everton felt like they could get something, there was a game on. And the minute they didn't, they just shut up shop and went, well, look, we're going to make it hard for you. And that suited them and went against us, really. You know, the, the, the thing with that, I, I was watching, obviously, I had a really nice vantage point up at Kenny for the game. And those counter-attacks that you were talking about, they tended to come from corners. Yeah. And I thought it was a really interesting sort of tactic from Dice because it kind of said to me, he threw everybody forwards and the, the last man was ahead of the centre circle, wasn't it? And it was inviting us to do the counter-attack. And it, it never changed, actually, when it went down to 10 men. But thinking back after the game, I was like, why did he continue to do that? I, and I came to the conclusion that he only thought he could score goals from set yeah. pieces. Mm. And whether it was 10 men or 11 men, he was going to throw as many bodies in the box as possible because that was their best chance of scoring goals against us. But it was also their biggest weakness for the game. And everything else in between, I thought he defended pretty well, yeah, to be honest yeah. with you. I thought he was solid about it and stuff like that. But that Diaz chance came from one of them, didn't it? Mm -hmm. But... and and. I don't know, I didn't watch the play ratings after the game or listen to it, but Alison Becker made a massive difference in those situations because he was so dominant from corners and from free kicks. And like he had that one save from Calvert-Lewin, didn't he? But how many times did he stop a corner going into the box? And like they were having a man on him and they were all over him and stuff. And I was like, that's why he's the best in the world because not only can he make those saves, but he's taken all the stress out of their best situations. And I just thought that was wicked. Yeah, no, I think that's right. There was one where he... A flap has become a bit of a generic term for when a goalkeeper doesn't get a total punch to the halfway line on it, but he got he, he palms it away, doesn't mm. he? At the back post, but other than that, you know, they and they were doing everything in their power to upset him. There was what like, they were putting Branthwaite on his toes. They were trying to disrupt everything he did, and he just handled it brilliantly. And this is the thing. They did nothing. And again, I'm sure when they're doing, they're going through their things, they'll point to, well, we went down to 10 men and then it was difficult. And it was, but it's because their manager chose to play five at the back from then on. He got to half time and he took their two creative outlets off and put a centre back and a right and a right back on effectively. And, I, and again, comparing Liverpool and Everton's not right because they're, they're at different levels, but I, I just wish they were leagues apart. <laughs> but I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've said this before. I don't care. I, I'd, I'd happily be, it would be one place apart in the league as long as it's first to second. That doesn't bother me. But they, um, 
they 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 dice ball and came out in full flow because they didn't have any hopes of getting anything out of that football match and his his entire hopes were pinned on old school British manager keep it tight keep it to within a goal and it's only one set piece away from us nicking something a heroic point or or whatever from this so I'm glad that it it totally caved and I'm glad ultimately when I mean, they took Michalenko off who was having a really good game <laughs> and then ultimately we scored, you know, off, off the back of it. So yeah, it basically fucking serves him, serves him right for being so shit. But it, they, they did nothing all game long. And even that, like the Calvert-Lewin one, that's a chance. But I mean, I'm no expert on the XG stuff, but like headers are not, having a header in from that position is not the same as having a chance at your feet from that kind of thing. It's nowhere near as big a, as big a chance He'd have as expected a header to than do him, better. Though. He'd have expected mm. to do better with that. It was the cross wasn't strong enough. It made it difficult yeah. for him. Yeah. You know, it's one of them where you can get power on a header, can't you? But where, where Van Dijk, I think it was Van Dijk was, it made it difficult for him to get power on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and ultimately, everything they did in an attacking sense came from something we fucked up. And in that instance, it was McAllister giving the ball away, wasn't it? And putting us under pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's speak about the Ashley Young red first, Chloe. I mean, it's the first time Liverpool have had a player sent off via two yellow cards for eight years. Eight years. Just to clarify, I'm, I'm not, that, that's not made up, by the way, for anyone watching or listening or wants something to talk about with the mates who support mm -hmm. on the football teams. The last player to be sent off via the medium of two yellow cards against Liverpool was Sadio Mane for Southampton. Um which I find mad for the start. Because um, in my memory, I think Everton get a player sent off that way every time we play them at Anfield, but apparently not. Um, what did you make of it? Because for me, neither of those look like anything other than yellow cards. He didn't argue. He, he, like, he, he didn't argue. I was looking at the commotion that was going on around the referee and only then did I realise that Ashley Young was halfway down the, the tunnel. Like, he didn't argue. He'd got off. The first one, he's just, he's been done uh, and, and wiped him out and he's he's taken the yellow. The second one was a bit mad because from where we were, we were it was obviously the other end, so the cop couldn't really see it well. We all thought it was a foul, but because the ball had went out for a what you'd assume a corner if he got his toe on it there was like screams for it but the referee was so delayed with it and once he gave the foul there was just it's got to be a yellow then it's got to be a yellow then he's literally going into, into the box if he doesn't make that tackle yeah. um and the referee gives himself time to think about it eventually does give the second yellow Ashley Young doesn't argue about any of it um and Luis Diaz with the ball like uh, quite a couple of those counter, counter attacks in the first half with the ball Luis Diaz's first touch wasn't good it was awful actually and sometimes he messed up but he changed the game because he got a red card for them and also I mean he, he could have had a penalty um but he, he changed the game with just being really fast and really quick with his with his brain, um, and yeah, to clear red guard, it's 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 a two yellows, a red, and I know we're gonna get onto Canate, so I'm not gonna say what I think about hmm. that, um, but yeah, I, I don't get why, and I, I haven't heard anyone argue over it. Diaz set him up as well because a couple of minutes early, he cuts inside and whips a ball in, mm. and then two minutes later, he goes around the outside. He kicked and, the ball and away as well. Yeah, Actually, he kicked yeah. the ball away five minutes before, didn't get a yellow guard when everyone was screaming for it. So he had it coming. He was, I mean, he's their most experienced player on the pitch. He's. Doesn't mean he's good though. Seven no. years. Like, he's, like, like, just, just, he's been doing it. He's been doing a very bang average job for a very long time. I, honestly, I, in fact, we did it in the preview. We, we, I did it in the pre match preview with Baz, the upper preview, and he was saying like, um, or he mentioned like, you know, James Milner. And I was like, yeah, James Milner and Ashley Young again. These are not the same things. They might be the same age, but like Ashley Young was was what like eking out his career in Serie A. And I know, look, I know, Chris, I know you're like the biggest Serie A super fan going, but it's fucking shite. It's a shite I league of football. I absolutely was 25 years ago. <laughs> I don't think it's fair to keep saying that I am now. I, you want to have a snorting defence of this the other week. Nobody watches Serie A. Yeah, nobody cares about Serie A. It's rubbish. But it basically, he was eking out his career in Serie A when James Milner was putting down like, I think all I said was Milan Champions could league. do a job, and I think Milan got the draw yeah. that week. Yeah, to be fair. Yeah, you went on a staunch defence of the quality of Napoli, uh, and therefore, therefore defending the whole quality of Serie A. It's a garbage league, and Ashley Young was garbage when he played in it. And now he's—I mean, again—he's a—he's a—he was a winger, ten midfielder, ten fullback. Again, James Milner trajectory. Ten bad shit catcher. But, but like, <laughs> he's garbage. Um, absolutely. But again, Dan, like. 
they need cooler heads to prevail in those kind of circumstances. Yeah. He's stupid. He gets the book in. I mean, look, it's so. It's just. It's. It's. I, I think we can blend this in with the Canate chat, I think, because I think Canates are just plain old, dead simple, run of the mill. Just stop your opponent getting away. They are cynical, but they're not dangerous. They're not. They're not violent moves. The Ashley Young first one is that is it's similar to that, but he leaves his entire leg in. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then the, the second one, it's just a it's just a foul. It's basically a tackle from behind. Yeah, and where it is on the pitch obviously plays a huge part in that as well. Because albeit Canate is both our yellow cards, at no point is he stopping his man getting inside the penalty area and a really dangerous situation sort of coming after it. But it was a mismatch from from the word go, really, Diaz against Young. I highlighted it in our build up show beforehand. I said that is where we should be looking to get a hell of a lot of joy. Because albeit Young is all the things we've mentioned in terms of the experience and stuff like that, like the the pace, the the, the difference in pace between the two. And if Diaz got the ball quickly enough, and was direct enough with his running and that type of thing. He was always going to cause problems. I didn't necessarily think it'd end up in a red card, but I just knew he was going to give him nightmares all afternoon. And if they weren't quick enough in getting like to Jack Harrison or Dwight McNeil around that to make it a two on one, it was always going to happen. And as we've seen, Diaz credit to him. Chloe's right in terms of he wasn't necessarily at it, but what he did do well is he made Asi Young make decisions yeah. and he made bad ones as it turned <laughs> out. Because really, really but, and you're right, there's a highlight his experience and it's the cool ahead type of thing. Because when you have been booked so early it's up to your manager then to take you off and go I'm getting you out the firing line mate because he's 15 years younger than you much quicker than you that could happen again so Dice has kind of messed up in not taking him off straight away because he easily could have done his best after he kicked the ball away but also Young Young knows he can't go to ground if anything he's got to let him go albeit yeah. who knows we might score yeah. he can't do that but again the, the problem you've got with Evan and it was one but again I joked about it in the, in the, in the upper previews like who's going to be the lad who does that who loses the head and gets sent off in this game no, we haven't really got players like that I was like there's always one it's someone who, who thinks they're buying into the culture of the football club mm. by oh it's a derby so I've got to be physical they're trying to win fans they're trying to win the fan base over by showing how much it matters to them but you get and you get a bunch of players who aren't that type of player doing stupid things Ross Barkley Rodwell Davies were all lads like that who were Tried, I don't know, somehow I'd like someone whispering, dogs of war, it's the dogs of war, remember the dogs of war, remember when you all get physical, get in their faces the derby. So you're not that player, mate, just calm it down, just you, you know, use use what you're good at instead. And him slide tackling, there was deers on the edge of the box, just just idiotic. Let's do, um, let's do Canate, Chris. Before we get there, though, Go why has no one spoke about Onana's shot trying to kip, uh, trying to chip oh, yeah. Alison from about yeah. 40 yards out and it doesn't even get it off the floor yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, we were joking he, he definitely watched the Beckham doc and went why has nobody tried this since David Beckham yeah. um, and of course people have yeah. people try it all the time it's yeah. just really really hard to do so it was incredible um, Ibu Kanate should he been sent off yes yeah, yeah probably nah carry on why? Two bookable offences. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> really, really easy. On a weekend where Ashley Young gets sent off for it, Kanji was it for Manchester yes. City yeah. for for almost the, well yeah exactly the same thing. Um, he knew what he was doing. He tried to he tried to make it difficult for him to get past. The break was on for Everton. It was two yellow cards. He should have been sent off. Sound. <laughs> <laughs> One's gone in our favour. I am. Um... It's weird, isn't it? How I I do and, wonder, and the fact that Klopp just went ten straight yeah. rounds of matches and went, yeah. fucking get up, lads, and then and because that just pissed them off more. Well, it was, was just pissing glorious. himself as well. Yeah. Laughing yeah. five minutes later, like pissing himself on the bench. That would have the blue fume would have been My life. Way. But it was just it was perfect. It was yeah. The Klopp substitution really compounded the whole thing, didn't yeah. it? And it was like Dice. That was what Dice was hottest about. Of like he knows he knows he should have. That's why he's taking them off. And Look, I, 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 I get thought... The book. I get the big get book! Get the big book! Get your quill! Um, Pot of ink! Blue ink! <laughs> blue ink! Make it blue! <laughs> um, yeah, the, honestly, the big book of Everton Injustices. Check it out from all great blue retailers. Um, they had a new chapter every single season. Yeah. Um, Klopp doing that did absolutely enrage them because it, I think Dice used it as almost evidence to suggest he felt they got away with one. And I think that's... Right, I do think that I do think they were going to make that change anyway. I'm not sure. I mean, he clopped him round the bench and was like he screamed at Matt. He screamed at who, uh, probably John Achterberg, whose job it is to hold the ball up. Like, get, hurry up, hurry up, you pricks, get around. 
Get him off! Um, fair, fair play. Look, he's got that opportunity to, opportunity to do that. If that was a pre-season friendly, he wouldn't have been booked and you'd have gone, do us a favour. Take him off, mate, because he, he, should, he, should, he should be off anyway. Mm. I contend, though, Chloe, and it's weird to say this because we've seen a lot of ref- this idea that referees kind of like to level things up, but I do wonder if... In se- I, I think the referees have been told not to give a, not to send as many players off, which sounds mental because four red cards got given out on, the, on that one day in the Premier League on Saturday. Thus proving that they can't follow rules. <laughs> no, 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 exactly. But I think he <laughs> was trying... Which I think is the problem with I, the refs in this country, but to be honest. I, I think they were trying their best to try and fly beneath the radar a bit. And I honestly wonder whether Jung being sent off actually almost helped Canate in a weird way because I don't think he wanted to preside over a football match that had two red cards in it somehow because I can't see any other reason why Canate doesn't get sent off because by the way we're interpreting all these things not one of us looked at either of them and went that's not that, he's stopping the guy running through it's an obvious yellow card maybe that's the case but therefore they're not actually doing their job then your job is to just give the decisions what they should be and Canate should have been sent off it's that simple he, uh, it, it, like there's people who say the more I watch it the more I don't think it's a foul it's a foul he, it's a, he knows what he's doing yeah. he knows what he's doing in that moment and I think we've got maybe one person behind him and to be fair Beto doesn't really have loads of support and maybe that helps Canate at the fact that they've got five men at the back they've gone a 5-4-1 or a 5-3-2 whatever it was um, and because what was it? They were out of ten, weren't they? Oh yeah, so sorry. Uh, five, five, three, one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I t- it's just a foul. It's a yellow card. It's cynical, and I'm fine with it because for the past three weeks, people have been telling me to just get on, and that referees <laughs> make mistakes. <laughs> so I'm now going to give you that exact same vibe. Um, everyone. These referees are incompetent. I think you should just really get on with the mistakes. Um, they are human, after all, and humans all make mistakes. And if you really want to fight it, all you need to do is get them suspended for next weekend. But mm. don't you worry, they will be back again. So you might as well shut the hell up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you should have been sent off. He wasn't. Craig Parson has, has done a madness. Um <laughs> Uh, but also, if they'd have, if we'd have been ten v ten, it wouldn't have helped them, because they'd have Sean Dyche would have felt like I've got to go for it now. I yeah. can't sit here being you know level terms in in terms of players and not try and get something from this game. And in terms of doing that, did there be more spaces and the counter attacks would have been on time yeah. and time and time and again? I'm boss with ten men. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, more importantly, I just want to have a general chat though, Dan, just to kind of move this forward because I, I got a message from me from my cousin about it. It was around the Ashley Young stuff during the game, and he was like, "What? What are they trying to do with all this?" Because I, I don't think both the yellows and both one of the Canate one plus the one that he didn't get. We can all sit here and go, "I can see perfectly legitimately why you get a yellow card for that because that's the way footy's gone." But at the same time. Why have we made? Why have the rules gone that way? Because this is getting this is getting worse and worse in football. Mm-hmm. Football is not a more violent sport. There's no more. It's you no know, five years ago. Football was not like didn't have this rash of just horrendous, you know, horrendous injuries. It wasn't like brutal game uh, sport by any means. So. Like, what are they trying to achieve? Because they're effectively making it easier for players to be sent off. And I don't get what the point of that is, unless they, they are they trying to add the drama? Are they, does it just go back into, they're trying to create a world where there's more respect, or they're trying to take certain challenges? Do they want people to take tactical fouls mm. out of the game? Is that what they're trying to actively discourage? Because mm. that, for me, is part and parcel of the whole game of stopping your opponent getting through. And I'm not... I, it's weird. I, I I don't mind. I am accepting of these being yellows, but I'm not sure how I've become accepting of yellows being handed out. Yeah, it's a strange one, actually, isn't it? When you really think about it, but it's almost as if at some point in the last, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine seasons, those became yellow cards, and there's always been yellow cards thereafter. It's like somebody, one of the refs, maybe decided that you just can't do that anymore, and they're sort of carte blanche. Every single referee has gone. Oh, actually, yeah, he's right. You can't do that type of foul. But I wonder whether, in terms of sort of an explanation, I wonder whether it's coming with sort of the rise in popularity of the D. And that's the type of foul that they commit all the time. We've seen Fernandinho get away with them forevermore for Man City, of Rodri. course. But, yeah, but I think the maybe same. now that position has become so pivotal and they're the fouls that they commit all the time, they become more common in the game, perhaps. I'm not quite sure, but you're right. There is just an acceptance now 
And it's even from a fan's perspective and certainly from referees one and the players one, they almost as soon as they drag someone back on the halfway line, they know straight away, don't they? It's a, a cynical is the word you used it all earlier. But for me, I can't remember a time but they sort of in the past five, six years where they weren't just yellow cards. I don't the most I, straightforward yellow card ever. I don't remember my entire like life years ago they growing, no, but in my mind they were. And I mean, that's just I, I, think I'm to, I was thinking about this because you mentioned this too was on on Saturday, I think, and I, I sort of came to the conclusion that it was like maybe it's just they don't want so many stoppages in football, and I think that the way that the game's gone, technically everybody are just better players and stuff, and now because of that, there are more and more examples of players trying to stop the game and not go for the football, and that and actually when you look at both yellow cards. I've got more of a problem with Ashley Young's second being a yellow card than his first because there's no genuine attempt to make the football mm-hmm. in his first challenge. Mm-hmm. In the second, there is. Yeah. And I that's the one where I go, when did that become a yellow yeah. card for yeah, just yeah. for just being yeah. slightly and late? This goes into this thing. I've always kind of I always turn my nose up at ideas when you throw totally outrageous by the existence of football concepts out. So when people say like the orange card, for example, or they talk about sim bins, I immediately balk because I just don't want anything rugby involved in my sport, you know what I mean, as much as possible. But the more and more you look at that, it's not violent conduct, really. You know what I mean? No one was injured. There was no goal-scoring opportunities, clear-cut, denied. You know what I mean? It wasn't sweeping someone's legs out when they're cleaning through. We all know those challenges we've seen. They're very few and far between is what I'm, I'm driving at. Nothing about those, like, all you're effectively doing by sending, and this is me defending the sending off of Ashley Young, by the way, is like, all you're doing by sending Ashley Young off for that is making it, d- determining the flow of the football match and actually ruining the flow of, of, of a football match, whereas, I don't know, I've never been keen to say, well, stick him in a, stick him, stick him off the pitch for five minutes and that's your advantage and then he gets to come back in, but half an hour into the game, the game is irreparably change probably for the worse and again we won this so I you know I, I shouldn't be sat here really complaining a win to win and a major side derby fucking laughing but you know if he if he's if he's punched Lewis Diaz in the head because he's lost it send him off and don't let, don't let him come back but those little accumulative fouls to change a game on that just feeds I don't know if it, it feeds into the pettiness of how games are being officiated for me and that's just stupid kicking the ball away and getting get sent off for kicking the ball away in a moment of just stupidity. That's mm. not losing your head and breaking someone's leg. That's you've kicked the ball away. It's like, I don't know. It's wasted as much time as a goalkeeper w- wasted on a goal kick. Mm. Every every goal kick. Like, it's not actually in the in the grand scheme of things, especially with multi-ball. Like, yeah. you kick that ball away, great, pass the other one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. really make any yeah. difference. The whole thing, just again, it just feeds back into this weird, like, school teacher trying to be really pernickety over every little thing because of what, for why, what are you achieving by it? You know what I mean? You're creating a bunch of rules, and the more rules you create, the more holes there are in those rules. Now, I'm talking about potentially making more rules or changing them, but... Have a, have a think about what those rules are meant to achieve. What what does that mean? Really Honestly, I do think it's the flow of the game. I think yeah. it's to take out the the challenges where people aren't making an attempt at the ball, yeah. and I've I've got no problem with that. Yeah. I, think, I think if you aren't making an attempt at the ball, it is a kind of cheating. Yeah, because you just know you're too late, so you're doing whatever you can. Yeah, and that's why I've got more of a problem with the yellow card yeah, than the second one yeah. because that is a yellow card. I'm, should it be? I don't know. Well, I think that's a good point, point because you're right. They're the ones that have, have drastically changed. Is if you make a legitimate attempt, attempt to play the ball and you miss, is that a, is that an instant He'd yellow card? Ball if Diaz didn't put his foot there last yeah. minute, yeah. And so he his foot was in a perfect position yeah. to take the ball away. And all the attackers know is I don't actually have to control this and keep it in. I just have to get my foot between their foot and the ball, and it's a yellow card. And that's where you go. Actually, over the last fifteen years, that now has changed almost unrecognisable. Mm. And, you know, this is the thing, we're not talking about, because we something we talk about in the car, you know, they outlawed the tackle from behind after Paul Elliott's had his leg broken and had his career ended. And, <laughs> and you, you watch, there's a great video and it's Graham Lasso watching his England performance. I think he played Brazil in like the 90s and he's watching it back and you can find it on YouTube, just say it's like Graham Lasso reacts to something like that. It's been years since I've watched it. It's brutal. Like, I mean, he, he'd have been sent off in three seconds if that was played in the modern game. That's different. We've curbed that now, but you're right. There's just a, there's a. It's just it's putting too much stakes on legitimate attempts to 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 win the balls so off. I just think it's a bit mad. I mean, and we've had bigger issues with refereeing in recent weeks. Hmm. But uh, do you guys know your thoughts on it? You know, if there's anything you would actively change, or you or do you think it's fine as it is? Ultimately, yeah. Let us know. Um, <laughs> Costa Shimikas, Chloe blocks him. Um, 
No, he would not. You're shaking your head. I knew you were going to come to me with it because you hate Costas Simicas. Oh no, I love Costas. Um, I love the way to he, say his name. He was the one who we all looked at the team and went, "Okay, that's where it's going to sort of the game might yeah. hang on him." No, Andy Robertson. There's going to be a lot of games passed his way in the next in the next weeks and months. Um, what did you make of his performance? Um, he was all right, yeah. I dad, he, he wasn't I, the first half. I, I think I wanted to murder him when he was in that dugout and there was a football on our pitch and they were attacking. I could have throttled the man. Yeah. I don't know. Wait until he was didn't doing. run off. When he didn't run off, when he was getting subbed, and he's walking, it's like hurry, oh, yes. up, Costa. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't even like the the in-game moments that did my head in. It was when he was sat on a dugout fuming mm. with Everton players whilst mm. they were attacking our end. Did that make the TV coverage stand? Oh, no, I didn't see that. So no. Costa gets bundled. Mm. The pitch. Does he get like bundled off the pitch a bit? The ball's out and it's around the dugout, and he he's chasing this ball down <laughs> to bring it back and to take a throw in. Mm. The ball's already in play. They've they've, ca- yeah. they've right, carried yeah. on, and he's, he's he, it, it must only be. <laughs> about three or four seconds but it felt like oh about a minute God. and a half Could that he was scrabbling around it was like Rocky chasing screaming. the chicken it's, free, it's on the bench <laughs> yes, we were all fuming at him um, I didn't I didn't think he was spectacular I didn't think he was horrific um, it's it's an area where I worry if you come up against a better side than Everton mm-hmm. I really do I can't deny that I think going forward you know he's he's, he's really good over set pieces I really like him um, I don't think he has the recovery pace of if someone puts it past him and gets in behind him um, and I just slightly worry more defensively when we go to a back three it doesn't suit him it just it doesn't suit him um, but I, I don't think he, he put in a horrific performance it was it was the moment of pure like what are you doing uh, that that did my head in where he was just going to retrieve a ball when they were on the attack down his side when it was like his his number came up and we were like oh well, that is the correct decision yeah and look how attacking we're going and as you turn around and expect the players to be on the pitch he's walked not even a yard because he's gone that slow um, <laughs> he sped up pretty quickly when he heard the, the, the rising hubble what are you doing what are you doing <laughs> it was all nil we were all for human um so yeah look he, he was he was all right yeah sometimes in the first half he, he lost the ball too easily um he was fine but yeah he once fine. again he was fine he wasn't spectacular he wasn't called upon defensively a lot was yeah. he is the point no certainly and second that's half. a problem so he's just that thing isn't he of like there's got to be one to keep an eye on if you've gone into that game and he's your big fear everything he does that isn't utter perfection is going to feed into that fear. Mm. I do think there's something down where we're going to have to remember how to play with him in that position yeah. because he can't play it like Andy Robertson. And I thought it was interesting. I thought Gomez was brilliant when he came on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a guy out playing on his wrong foot on that side. But actually, Gomez loves getting up and down. He's got pace. You know, it was I think Shimakas was forever looking for that that... I'll take a touch. I've got half a yard of space here and I'll whip a ball in. He put a couple of good ones in early early doors, which is interesting because it's so far away and it's so long away when you're coming out the match. I didn't even remember that. It was only when I went back and watched it again. There's going to be an interesting conversation, I think, in the coming weeks between someone like Joe Gomez, does Gerald Quanta get a little bit more of a look in if it's more of a centre-back role? But Costas was fine. But I also don't think he necessarily put to sleep any doubts that he's the main man with Andy Robertson. Out. No, I'd absolutely agree with that wholeheartedly, to be honest. I think a couple of deliveries were really sort of noteworthy and you thought that's what he's very good at and that's where he does shine through. But I agree. I think Joe Gomez's little cameo at it, for me, has only sort of further instilled the belief that Gomez could do it. And obviously, Jurgen Klopp was at pains to say in the press conference, it's not just Tim McCass, it's Gomez. It's, you mentioned Luke Chambers as well, who interestingly yeah. played for the 21s against Benfica yesterday, and he'd been out injured before that. So perhaps we'll see a bit of him in the Toulouse game or the Bournemouth game thereafter. But yeah, I thought it was fascinating that Klopp mentioned these other lads and then went to Gomez so soon in the game. I would not be shocked in the slightest if Joe Gomez got a decent run at left back. Because Tim McCass is fine. But you mentioned there, how do you play with Simicasa? It is different to Robertson. Is it an easier transition to go to someone like Gomez? Potentially, certainly, if you are going to go to a back three at times like we do, I would, wouldn't shock me in the slightest if Gomez got a run. 
it was interesting that he also referenced that Jared Branthwaite is a left footed centre half I've as well. That. Like it was a very, yeah. very specific Pointed piece of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. brilliant, by the way. And I actually think Sarkowski was really good for them as well. You say, he was, video, you say he was brilliant. There was a moment where a ball's coming out of the air and he goes to kick it in that second half and he just misses the ball completely and the entirety of the stadium yeah. absolutely took the piss out of him. He, he was solid. Uh, he was good he was aside solid. from that. Yeah, he's I'll give him that. He's, he's but that was hysterical. Um, Klopp didn't fuck around with the subs, did he, Chris? You know, I think there was a real sense, again, it's Everton, it's Everton. That probably should be enough, but it's 10-man Everton, we're at home. Liverpool need these three points, they shouldn't be in question. I mean, we effectively went to two at the back with the substitutions that we made for a bit. Um, because I was lad next to me, you figure that out. It's like, is it a back three? Yes, it's a back three, but it's Trent in it, so it's not a back three. But the bad thing is, Diaz just knew what he was doing straight away. Yeah. Like, I don't know whether there was a... A mention of that at half time or something that that was going to come in because as soon as he they, you know he lined up he was there and I was like okay Diaz knows but he's the other side of the pitch how does he know that that's coming like but he was brilliant and that actually freed him up it gave him more time and more space uh, on the ball and it was kind of inevitable then that he was going to be the one to make to make something happen because he didn't have to worry about being a defender and sort of playing that sort of left back stroke left wing back role that he was in but he was able to get into the penalty area and again you know he could have had a penalty maybe before we get the the penalty i mean he was just clashing that role to be honest with you and the extra the extra bodies up front just scared the shit out of Everton. Like, you know, Nunes being up there and having to give them something. Jota was playing brilliantly, oh, you know, slaloming when he had the, the ball. He was just causing an absolute nightmare for them. Joe Gomez running from deep, obviously, a little bit later on. Do, does himself in a 6 one nine without a ring, which was impressive <laughs> when he took the shot on. Like, um, he, shot, it was some shot, but the way he fucking spun round after he, he nearly took off like a helicopter. Um, he was just absolutely brilliant. And, so yeah, I mean, he changed the game. He knew exactly what he was doing, and I think at times we've seen Jurgen, especially like when we were, was it was it Man United when we got uh, they got a man sent off against us, or was it Everton? One of those years when we lost by a point, and he didn't capitalise on those. I think it was Everton. It was Everton. Uh, no, I don't know. I can't remember now. I'm sure there was a game where well, we played. It was the it was United the with injuries. Off bench, oh, it was injuries. United yeah. with injuries, wasn't it? That yeah, was yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't capitalise. Yeah. He drew both of them that year. Didn't and he, he didn't capitalise. He was dead conservative in the way that he approached the substitutions and stuff when they were there for the taking. This time he's like, I'm not making those mistakes again. I'm going to go out there and we're going to put everything. And certainly not at Anfield, and certainly not Everton, and certainly not with ten with, with ten men. No, I I, I loved it. it, and it was telling as well. Speaking to the maturity Dan of what he's doing when we get the goal he changes it back that's when Gomez comes on and we actually go back to more of a more of a back four he's like great we've gone all we've, we've pressed all out attack yeah. and then we've got the goal okay the penalty fine we'll, we'll, we can just go back to how we, we go back to managing this game let them come out at us and you know it was just it was actually perfect management for that second it half. was absolutely spot on yeah it was he's nailed it there and one of the biggest criticisms during Klopp's time if there are any to be made of his brilliant tenure are his substitutions and that game management side of things I think he's always got it spot on but this time he absolutely did and it was probably a sense of, as you alluded to there, that Everton would have to sort of show at least a little bit of a hand. They haven't done for half an hour because they knew it was sort of all hands on deck. Let's try and keep them out as much as possible. But when you go 1-0 down anyway, there's no point just seeing how the game was 1-0 because what do you achieve from that? You yeah. keep the goal difference down, potentially, but that's it. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're always going to have to try something. So we probably felt like Everton could win a couple of corners, a couple of sort of set pieces, like Chris said before. And it's at that point, we'll hit them anyway. We'll strike regardless of what formation we're playing. If we can go to being more sensible and not have two at the back now and we can just play our normal footy and we're likely to score again of course as it pans out that's what we go and do because the attacking players that we had on and the decisiveness in which we were able to get out from the back was their old game really like that sort of counter-attack in that up until the sort of final third and that final pass we were really clinical with that sort of stuff and obviously the pace and the added quality that we've got was always going to shine through and for the second goal obviously it's McAllister that gets it down isn't it and he's got that awareness and that presence of mind because how many people have just wellied that to the halfway Line, like minutes to go and gone let's just get it away from our goal but he was really calm at the moment yeah no brilliant stuff a um, bit more on Diaz then Chloe. pinch outs I got back in and I put the the, the TNT coverage of it and Ali McCoyst and Leo Ferdinand were incredibly dismissive of that Luis Diaz being fouled in the box pinch out 
I again, and we we I think we talked about it outside the ground of like it's hard to tell because you're in the moment and it looks like it looked nailed on. Everything's you know? a pen when you're in the ground. Yeah, of course, yep. absolutely, everything hmm. is a pen. Um, the more I watch that back, I, I I can't see how it's not. I mean, in the commentators were going, "That's a dive," you know, and and I know that there's a degree at the end where Diaz lets out a bit of a shout and he does maybe arches the back a little bit, but Patterson he cuts him back inside, he slides and his knee takes a standing foot away. I, I don't know. It was just a pen. And I, and I don't know whether that then leads to us them being a little bit more lenient. I don't know what the handballer follows, but I, I thought that was the clear, the, the clearest one, to be perfectly honest. Inside the ground, I, I thought it was a, a pen because from it was literally right in front of me. And from where we were, you could see that Patterson gets nowhere near the ball. Um, and he does make contact with, with uh, Lewis Diaz. And I, I think I, I asked you, I was like, what, what happened there with that penalty? Because from where we were, it looks like he's made no contact with the ball whatsoever and just the man. Um, and because in, in time, it looks faster than probably what he does actually hit Diaz with. Everyone inside that ground thought... I was that not a penny's made contact. Um and to be honest, I, I haven't watched it back too many times. I, I saw I saw your video of it. Um and even then it, it he gets nowhere near the ball, he just gets the man. Um but I've I, I let it go because we, we did get a pen, rightfully so, that the second time round. And maybe if we wouldn't have, I'd have been looking at that one uh, over and over and over again. Um but it, it was one of them where I don't think there's like there's not enough contact to completely wipe Lewis Diaz out, but also the player hasn't made contact with the ball at all. He has made contact with the man. So I, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of both. I, I like, I don't think there's enough contact for it to be a nailed on pen, but also this player's nowhere near the ball and has actually made contact with the man instead. Yeah, I don't know. I, Adam, have we got the end of the eye turned on? Yeah. Can we just put the clip up? So yeah, I, this was from the, the footage I got and it's, it's easy, but it's easy to see on the on the close up. But it's the the left knee and the ankle of Diaz. It's just a I don't know. It, uh, it's soft, that if you get that, I don't think it's a penalty. penalty. Really? I honestly yeah. don't. No, I quote tweeted that. It's, I don't think it's a pen. I think when VAR first came in, it was first introduced. They were giving penalties for stuff like that week in week out. Yeah. And like any contact in the box, if you don't get the ball, penalty. I don't think it is. I don't think there's enough in it. I really don't. I think if he completely wipes him out, like full pace wiped out then yeah but he's just you've got to go to ground at some point you're gonna touch the opposing player let that be for me like it's a, it's a contact sport still yeah. like the oldest phrase but you're gonna be contacting the box not everything has to be a penalty i actually don't think even at the time i didn't think it was i don't think he's dived no oh, absolutely not i no. don't think it's a penalty I, th I think there needed to be more pace or, or mm. the, there was not enough contact for it to be a pen but I wouldn't say it's an out and out dive either because he has made contact I'd be with livid if that was the other end against us yeah. livid yeah I, the roof, I, like, I, think for, I think for me I agree the problem we've got with the VAR stuff is this like it's a clear deliberate and obvious error kind of stuff where if that gets given in normal time I don't think anyone I don't think anyone bats an eyelid at that being a penalty because he takes his, he does take his leg out when he cuts him back. But we're back into this, back into this, aren't we? The referees are still fucking shite. Um, the handball, see, Ten. like, I know his arms out. Go on, Chris, what's what, what, what thoughts on the handball? It's a natural position if you're waiting for a taxi or a bus. <laughs> 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 That's the only, only time it's a fucking... Natural position, isn't it? Well, I mean, what a gonna... stupid yeah, defender, yeah. you know what I mean? He's just an idiot. He's the thickest defender in the Premier League. So if he's not scoring own goals, he's giving super penalties away. He is absolutely useless, him, mate. I don't know why he's doing that. If that's for balance, right, sort your equilibrium out, mate. You've got something in your ears. There's something not right here, pal. It's got a major in ear issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bit of a head cold. Yeah, he's fucking bullish. I, yeah, I don't know. I, it's one of them, isn't it? Like, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not tearing my nose up on it, but... Do you think? Do you think the Diaz one was more of a pen than that? Hundred percent. Really? Oh, no, no, I, that's I, I a disagree. Nailed one get. <laughs> I disagree. He's playing basketball. It, it literally, it is. Why is his arm that far out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's why, okay, why, yeah. Why, like, uh, but it was funny because obviously in the ground, I don't know what the coverage shows, but they're all they're all around the referee and Tarkovsky's going it's 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 by his sides by his sides and I think I, I like <laughs> shouted to him you effing weapon it's out like it was just as soon as it happened 
it was a nailed on pen. Yeah. I cannot believe everyone in, in that entire stadium could see that, but the ref a yard away couldn't. Yeah, he's closer to doing every letter <sighs> of the YMCA than it is to being by his side. So exactly. Clear, yeah. the, the, it's just no, no penalty. You can't have your arm out there. Yeah. Stop it. I don't know. It goes back to this thing again. I just He's not trying to stop the ball, is he? You know what I mean? It's... I'm happy it was a penalty. I thought the other one was more. I don't think, you, ha- I don't, I don't think you have to try and stop the ball. I think the the point is, is it is it is it in the silhouette of yeah. your body? Yeah. And no, not, <laughs> it's not just as simple that. as that. If the ball doesn't hit Michael Keane, does it hit any of our players in the box and lead to a goal? Yeah, that's the thing. Whole thing's bollocks in it. The um, let's talk about Patchy. Talking about bollocks, Mohamed Salah was fucking rubbish. <laughs> he was fucking rubbish from start to finish in that game of football. Bags of brace. I think he got man of the match in some, certainly in some quarters. Um, Dan, mm. he was terrible. Uh, Michalenko absolutely had him on toast. Every time he tried that little ball, to, you got, the ball played him on the corner of the box and he tried a little curled cross that hit the man in front of him every single time without fail. Um, every time he tried to stand his man up, he really struggled with it. Look, it's a, I guess it's, it's elite, isn't it, to then turn that performance and then two clinical moments take your chances. Um, but I, I'm, I'm happy to sit here and have a laugh at how rubbish Mo Salah was because he was dreadful. Yeah, he stunk the gaff out. Absolutely <laughs> stunk the gaff out. He was properly terrible. I mean, you know, I, I seen Virgil van Dijk, funnily enough, I read his interview just before we came down before, and he was praising Mikhelenko's performance. He said, yeah, Salah wasn't at it today. And since the Bosley said something similar, didn't he? He was like, kept losing the ball, but we kept giving it back to him. So <laughs> nice um, but Van Dijk was sort of saying, Mikhelenko's really good against him and he was you've got to praise him but yeah Salah was woeful absolutely woeful but as you say gets two big moments and puts the ball in the back of the net twice and that's kind of what Salah does I guess he's normally a lot better than that of course but it was interesting like normally it's that was a Jota-esque performance because Jota's yes. normally crap yeah. and then scores at the end yeah. but Jota everything he did was boss yeah. and, and, he Salah, didn't score. and he didn't score it was really weird like Freaky Friday swap bodies <laughs> you, you do that bit it was such a weird weird game from that perspective because yeah the Salah was not at it in the any way, shape, or form, and I was sort of I mentioned sort of the young and Diaz battle earlier on. I thought Salah was going to Michelenko, but it was the opposite way around. Salah just couldn't get it going at all. Could he? I don't know whether his mind was elsewhere or what, but he was dire. Well, it's mad because he obviously put that um, video out about yeah. uh, Palestine and Israel, didn't he? And I didn't get really give it a second thought. Just, oh, it's nice, nice that he's actually used his platform, good humanitarian message. But I was reading the Athletic article around it and how much thought goes into that release and how many takes and how much pressure he's had from all kinds of sides on that kind of stuff and I'm not saying that was it you know but like you forget sometimes how much he carries around with him as a as an absolute icon and yeah I mean ultimately he's got two goals in a derby Chris so I'm not sure he's going to be too upset with his overall performance but it was almost a bit like particularly when he scored the second one it was a bit almost like apologetic of like right cool we're done with this let's just go and get it I met James after the game and the first thing he did he was like it was like he was angry that he scored that goal. Oh, God, I don't deserve this, but I'll put it away for you. Anyway, like, and, and that's kind of what it felt like. He was, he was really poor, but you know, I must admit, when it came to the penalty, I was thinking that it was Sabozlai that was going to take it because he held the ball the entire time, didn't he? Up until Mo then comes from nowhere because like Mo was sort of sheepishly looking down, but obviously thinking back now, you know, Henderson used to do that mm. thing where he'd. Keep the but keep the keep the other players away from the penalty taker, and I think it was just a good way of everyone going. Well, sabozlai has got the football here. No one was anywhere near Salah. He was just sort of pacing on his own. I thought he looked sheepish about it, and I was wondering whether he was going to take the ball off Sabozlai. And as soon as it happened, I was like, "Oh, Mo's taking the ball." gone in there and you're like that's exactly what we needed two really good penalties now he's taken in his last two and stuff mm-hmm. um, who was the fellow who was stood on the spot Virgil. as well Virgil stood well, on the spot too, so that's yeah. again you know a little bit different way of doing it but all important parts of how to win football games it's interesting I wasn't going to talk about this but I, I, something I, I've noticed that Trent does as well is that at the end of every half he goes over and talks to the referees and basically he almost every game walks off the pitch with the referees and just 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 chats them and, and I think it's a very Jordan Henderson thing of making sure you've got a relationship with these people and, I, and I, you know, I've mentioned to Bosley previously of how he's got great leadership he's got really obvious leadership qualities on the pitch but you know Jordan was so good at doing all of the other things he was never the best player in the team but he brought all those other bits all the bits you can add you can choose to add that you're not born with necessarily he added and it's great to see actually some other people kind of pick that up around the pitch yeah really good um, Harvey Elliott boss 
Brilliant, absolutely Jeez. brilliant. What a, what a performance that yeah. was off the bench. Um, Ryan Gavinberch was incredible too. Yeah. I'd like to give him props as well. I thought he's, First 35. he's such a silky footballer. Yeah. Him. Um, but Harvey Elliott, you could see the desire on him. You could see him when he came on, turn around and go, I'm not having these shit get a point out of us. <laughs> absolutely not. He came on, he was everywhere. There was a there was a ball which was like so far, they boosted it so far up in the air. And I think they were on the counter if Harvey Elliott doesn't take a good touch and the touch spins him and he, he frees the ball away and makes it and I was like oh my god um, his range of passing the one that's tipped onto the bar Jordan Pickford mm. does incredible for um, I, I thought he was immense when he came on he was full of energy full of desire full of heart full of running um, and full of quality um, and it wasn't just him trying to go down the left hand side and and uh, feed Salah time and time again no he, he took it upon himself he'd carried the ball he'd switch he might have been our man in the match. Yeah, he could have been. He was exceptional when he came <laughs> on, um, and he was so unlucky not to have a goal as well. And when that when that get, got saved, oh, the way he hit himself, he was fuming. <laughs> and I was like, "Don't worry, lads. Like you, you've been boss, but were they the moments boss, yeah. that are going to determine that? Because it's so competitive that, and obviously we've mm. got, got Curtis Jones to come back in as well. And it's interesting it goes back to like that the recency bias, but also the distance bias of being in the cop. I didn't really know much of Gavin Birch other than some nice neat touches, but then I went and watched that like two and a half minutes of every touch stuff. God, and I was like, was so my awesome. God, he was unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, it was that one on the edge of the box where it gets fizzed into him and without looking, he just clips it like to his left across the 18 yard box and, and we're in. It's like, that is ludicrous that you should yeah. be that good. But actually what you've got in, in that group of players and, and Supper's like comes into this as well. These are young footballers who are all got really big, look like really nice, really good lads as well, really love footy. And I think they're all going to drive each other on. And I thought Elliot was um, Elliot was brilliant. Um, good to see we got a little bit of love for Jotter in there as well. But lastly, on the game itself, um, Darwin, Chris, um, we were our counter attacks <laughs> so shit all game. And then there comes Darwin, who is often the man who kind of conspires to kind of tangle himself up. <laughs> I did wonder if he was gonna, he was if he'd held on to it too long. But ultimately, it's a perfect pass to Salah. It's it, he puts it on the plate for him, and you know that's how the game ultimately gets sewn up is because of Darwin Nunes's composure. Yeah, and you can see in the in, in the celebration from Salah, he's just pointing at him, so he knows exactly who who it was. But a little shout out for Sobersly actually in the build up to that goal, which I don't yeah. think anybody's talking oh. about. Mm -hmm. He's catching up with 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 the two of them, yep. and he's about to get in the way of the pass. Okay and just stops, and just at the time that Darwin Nunes has settled himself in for a pass, so really good awareness from all three of the players, you know, Salah to keep himself on side, Sabah's like to not get involved, and Darwin Nunes for the way to the pass and drawing the defender before waiting for it, after running 30, 40 yards with the ball at your feet in full flight, everything just seems to be slowing down and coming to him at the moment, doesn't it? Uh, and that's exactly what we need from Darwin Nunes, obviously the stats are going round at the moment, aren't they? All the goals and assists per 19 and being top of the Premier League after I think it's 300 minutes or something played. Yeah. You know, you can see that he's having enough impact there now. Um, he's got a connection and has had a connection, I think, going back to last season with Salah anyway. They tend to feed each other quite a lot. Well, as both ways. He's got eight, eight Premier League assists and they're all for Mo Salah. Yeah. Um, More than Sadio Mane, I've seen yeah. on the weekend, mm -hmm. which is mental. I mean... They hated each other, remember? <laughs> <laughs> they hated each other, Dan. Over that course of time compared to this course of time, yeah, that's crazy. Like, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, well, it is also, absolutely insane. That's just something last season where you'd think Darwin Nunes might get stuck in two minds and not know what to do. But what he did was, he the, the, by holding on to the ball so long, Jordan Pickford had made the decision where... He was like, if if he shoots here, yeah, I look ridiculously stupid. So I need to move over as far as I can to the opposite side. He did side. what he did last season. And he did yeah. it. He got he came out and he got lost somewhere, which just meant as soon as Salah could hit the ball, as long as he got it any part on the right hand side, it was going in because Jordan Pickford had left so much space. Um and the composure and the calmness, because as you can imagine, the crowd are screaming for you to pass that ball. To have the calmness and composure to lay it off to him with a perfectly weighted ball in the correct place so Salah can just run onto it and finish it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really, really enjoying watching Darwin Nunes and it's mad that he's only had three Premier League starts this season because if I was to choose my front three tomorrow, he'd be on number nine. Yeah.
Go on, Dan, what? Yeah, Dan, just on that very last point, really. Yes, yes. But also, like, there's been a few little problems Injuries around him. Stuff, Injury yeah. stuff. So I think that sort of played it. He might have started yes, um, the weekend, rather, if it wasn't for cramp in the week for your yeah. and He had a, I, a toe problem just, as well previously. It, just, it reminds me a bit, like, like last season almost was a, just a... Like a tra- training season for a guy we paid eighty odd million pounds for, but he, he feels ready now. But it reminds me a bit of Torres's first season where everyone wanted him in the team. He was clearly brilliant, but you, you've got to manage him. You know we can't afford. There's a, clearly a guy who's going to transform how our attack plays. But if you play him ninety hundred minutes week in week out, there won't be a footballer there to to utilize. So uh, the Jota was the right. I thought was the right decision ultimately. Uh, again, he has a really good. A really good performance from him. Um, and yeah, Darwin gets to come on and have the, the impact. Great. M- more, more of that, please. Um, okay, cool. We're going to take a short break when we return. Um, a couple of things just in terms of the importance of those three points. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the atmosphere. Seeing lots of talk around the apparently crap atmosphere of the derby. Um, but we'll address that in part two. See you in a sec. Yes, if you haven't done so already, head to redmanmerch.com and grab your knitted Christmas jumper. Selling fast. Once they're gone, they're gone. I'm aware. I've said this for weeks. It's October. But, you know, early bird gets the jumper. Um, <laughs> right. Um, what do you say? Yeah, is it the, that famous <laughs> saying. And if it isn't, it is now. We'll get that on a T-shirt. Um, Chris, the three points. Um, and and I, I think you can tell. We mentioned it before. 10 man, it's Everton, blah, blah, blah. It's the run of games coming up. Yeah. This is where a title challenge is going to be built for Liverpool. We're going to be looking on the Bias Football Podcast this week because I've been saying all season and every for every season, it's 10 games. Look at the league table after 10 games, see what that where that stands. Liverpool have got a very good chance to be right in contention. And But we talked about it in the build to the game. If you don't beat Everton, all of a sudden you've lost to Spurs, you've drawn with Brighton and you've lost or drawn to Everton. You're in bad form and the, the momentum you've built all of a sudden has turned against you. It was so, it was just beyond important to make sure they got over the line in this one. Yeah, of course it was. Obviously the derby is, is a massive thing, you know, for everybody who's a Liverpool fan and for obvious reasons. And you, you have to beat the teams who are worse than you. You know, you have to almost beat everybody to win a league title nowadays. It's, you know... It, I, I, it's actually funny I was sort of thinking about this and I don't know the best way to phrase it but it's like I've for years been like you like 10 games 10 games but it feels like this is a weekly league almost now where everyone's opinions on sides are almost shaped on a weekly basis and we actually don't know anymore until way late who were the good ones and who were the bad ones and it feels like you know us Arsenal Tottenham Manchester City we're all going about our business at the moment Aston Villa Aston Villa as well, of course, you know, but after the first couple of weeks of the season, they were terrible, you know, and, and that's the, I think that's the 24 hour news cycle thing, isn't it? Where everybody focuses on absolutely everything at all times. Um, it's obviously important. It's a good one of games for Liverpool. It's the hardest one out the way now. The early kickoff was obviously a thing that we have to deal with. I think that might have fed into any atmosphere issues if there were any in the ground, but ultimately you've just got to win and winning, Without playing your best, it's, it's, it's always championship form. Yeah. It, and it, that's never going to change, no matter how we analyse, how we talk about football. We're not even into fit, you know, what, 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 what gear do you go into? Because we always say that <laughs> a second, we're not in fifth gear yet. No. Yeah. We're nowhere near fifth gear. This yeah. side is still coming together. 
you know, you talked about the midfield a little bit earlier. It's funny, isn't it? When you got great footballers, they all want to do their own little things, but it's not until they mesh together and there's that sort of understanding where you start to see the best of them. Inside the first five minutes, there was some play through the middle against Everton, oh, Everton where, where it, it ended up with Mo Salah off. fucking it up, <laughs> which was some of the best football I think I might have ever seen at Anfield. They're the moments that you need to turn into spells. You know, they need to last 10, 12, 13, 15 minutes, whatever, instead of just one moment and then you don't see it again for the rest of the game. That's the stuff that we're aiming for. And the more moments you start to get, the more it will turn into spells. It's We've, we've lived on this knife edge, Chloe, for years where it feels like you've got to win every single game of football, otherwise you can't win the title. We kind of got lucky the last two game weeks because of how other fixtures fell and rivals not you know not pulling away with it city dropping points has actually helped everyone feel there's a world an alternate universe where city have got probably another six points on the board and we're all going well that's that's all done and dusted now already that's what puts this this little run of games into such sharp focus is we yeah, we got away with one. We 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 could get away with losing and drawing a game of football and not be totally out of the running. But then you then can't you can't your margin for error's gone. You can't then lose to Everton and you can't lose to Forest and you can't lose to Luton and you can't lose to Brentford. Ideally, you want to be putting twelve points on the board after these and then. But again, it momentum. It's not really a real thing, but it but it but it feels like it is. And to not to not win the derby, I think totally cuts the legs off what we're trying to do in this period. So it's great that we can just kind of put it to one side and go, all right, what's who's next? No matter how crap Everton Football Club are, it's a derby. Um and it is a massive game of football. And it's a game where Liverpool have sometimes came unstuck, mainly at Goodison, uh, rather than at Anfield, but it's it's never a nailed on, no matter how crap they are. It might feel like that to you, <laughs> but it doesn't it doesn't to me. Um and I think Liverpool out of the top six have possibly had the hardest running so far to start the season and to say that the one point potentially three how I think Spurs will win tonight off the top is ridiculous and now we've had our spell of really hard games and we will have another spell but up until the November international break we've got winnable fixtures fixtures that you think right well we can gain points on on other teams yeah and by the time of hard fixtures come around again because I think we've got Arsenal, Newcastle and Manchester United all in December all of around Christmas that is vile um, <laughs> by the time those games come and no around Robbo as well, and no Robbo by the time those games come around hopefully the results and the performances that you put in against the side that should be winnable um, have helped you either create a little barrier so if you do fall you know you've got a cushion to fall on or you know those games mean even more and when you get big points out of them it causes worry in the rest and what we've got to realise is we've got another international break and after that international break it's straight into City and it's City away you need to use every ounce of you know positivity and, and bounce to get into that game you need to scare them you need that game to count for something mm -hmm. um, and you need to put yourself in that position and to do that you need to win these games and I think it would have been a lot harder because Everton is a team Liverpool should be beaten based on the fact of what they've got on their starting eleven and what they can do. And if you would have dropped points, especially down when they were down to ten men and when it felt like Liverpool really should have scored from several, you know, counter attacks, um, there would have just been a little bit negative atmosphere. Where well, it now counters it's the not. Newcastle vibes, you know, like yeah. if Newcastle gave us that thing of like this side will go, we'll find ways to win. And Tottenham could have done that, but there were so many extenuating circumstances that we all end up taking that as a bit of a positive. Don't fucking lose. I mean, it was like Klopp. I thought he was really interested in his pre match press conference. He was like, I don't care about the record that we've got. About. I don't want to talk about it. Let's not, like, let's not talk about it because it's no need to add extra pressure to all this. No. But the thing, Chloe's point, right? That's what the aim is. You've got to go to, we've got to go to the Etihad after the next international break. And your worst case scenario is, is it's not a title decider. Mm. And what I mean is, we've, we've had them so early in seasons, and whoever's won that has pretty much gone on and won the title, certainly the year we won it. it. It really felt like, and it was too early to say it at the time, but it was we put we put a real gap uh, at, that, at that game. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd managed our season up to that point. We were talking about the, the Aston Villa game of not playing yeah. Fabinho and Villa, so he wasn't suspended for, um, for Man City, mm -hmm. and we beat them. And there's sliding doors where there's a swing there and it ends up in Liverpool's favour. Mm -hmm. Our worst case scenario is if we lose at the Etihad, which is very possible, the worst case is that it's, 
Four you know, points. Exactly. It's it's four it's four points, which is recoverable. Yeah, one hundred percent it is, yeah. And I think sort of on the back of Saturday winning the derby, that does set us off on this run now, fixtures that do look favourable. But not for me, like regardless of who we were playing, I always look at us as being capable of putting a run together that's just perfect. And I think looking at what's to come now, I, I see no reason why we can't do that again. And we can go into that Man City game with it not being so much pressure on it. Like, obviously, you want to go there. And if you can go there and go in with the sort of the mantra, if we're ahead of City by that point, which I kind of expect us to be, looking at the fixtures, I really do. Because they've obviously got the Manchester Derby coming up next and stuff like that. So, so I think... So three points, points then? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I think there's no reason why we can't go into that ahead of them at worst. Where Tottenham and Arsenal are at that point, who, who knows, really. But... Yeah, I, I think we can, and I think we will, to be honest with you. I don't see anything stopping us in terms of what's to come, in terms of the fixtures. So, But you're right, if we go there and it's not sort of the be-all and end-all of if you get beat, that's you, done and dusted, then that's just a huge relief. Because going there is so, so important for titles. And if we can go there and just get a draw, and yeah, quite happy just with give a draw. Me one point. Sound by me, absolutely. Also, Arsenal's... Point against Chelsea makes ours look really good as well. Um, so well, hopefully, when City have to go there, they come a little bit unstuck. We'll, well them getting better that. might help us because they might take points off people. Yeah. Like well, we were saying this. We're, we're going to do a little bit on the Newcastle and the Tenali stuff in the bias as well. But yeah, there's just something to sometimes things are worse for you because. It makes it easier for opponents, and other times it can work the other way around. They all have Aston Villa as well, where we've played them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So. Um, I want to talk about the atmosphere then? Because honestly, I, I I didn't give it a second thought after the game. I didn't think the atmosphere. I had no particular standout thoughts. I didn't walk away from the derby thinking that's the best Merseyside derby I've ever experienced. Far from it. I didn't think that was in my top ten or anything. You know, I I just hadn't given it a thought at all. But I saw. Uh, a rash of comments around it on the vlog and I've seen a few bits on Twitter and I've seen a few things on Redmen's comments as well of people talking about the atmosphere and I don't know how many of those people were in the ground but I, I, th- I feel like because I, I put the game back, back on again so I had but I don't in the background while I was editing when I got in last I feel like it might have been mentioned in in commentary which I think always has an impact on people's opinions on stuff um what do we what do we think the, the atmosphere so it's all right um, where I was was pretty poor, to be honest with you. Um, well, but by comparison, by comparison to <laughs> right, right, let me let me give you some background first of all. I'm normally in the cop for these games. Yep. Um, I ended up in the upper Kenny for this one. I sit in the upper Kenny for the Auto Cup scheme, so I know that block. Compared to what that normally is, it was a great atmosphere. <laughs> compared <laughs> My to how was I going, no- they were singing in the upper Kenny, he was <laughs> made up. Compared to how I normally experience a derby, a very different atmosphere, <laughs> shall we say? Um, but I'm when I'm there, you know where the seat is. You're sort of twenty yards towards the away end more than anything. So you can obviously hear the cop, but you can hear the away end more because they're just closer to you. Um, and 305 is the other side, you know, as well. So it's a little bit further away. Um, it sounded like the cop was fine to me by, by what I can normally hear from a, a Europa League game and, and all that. And obviously, you know, the cup games and stuff. Um, but it was just a bit different for me. I thought, Scott. I, 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 I think there was a period in the second half where it was quite subdued. Yeah. I thought up until... Ashley Young got sent off. It was really good. I I thought it was mm-hmm. sound. We were we were going through songs, um, and actually, whilst nothing was happening during the game, all of my videos were just songs and chants. And Paul Scouts and Tommy was really good. That was sung quite a couple of times actually, yeah. um, and then. Once Ashley Young got sent off, uh, I think we had maybe 10 minutes left in the half. It kind of went down because Liverpool didn't seem to capitalise enough and we were kind of frustrated. And at the start of the second half, it was like everyone hadn't got back to the seats. Yeah. I agree. It was it was a bit crap at the start of the second half. Um, but then when... When, once again, we changed the formation and everything and we really went for it, I thought it was good again. And then there was a point where it's just expectation of 1-0 up, it's undusted really, it's Everton. And I think it, it got a bit quiet again. Um, and I think the second goal, there wasn't as big of a let-off as you'd imagine it would be. Yeah. Um, but what, I think that was just because people were like, well, Everton have offered absolutely not. And when in my head it was, oh my God, they've got a corner in the 95th minute, oh my God. I think everyone else was like, yeah, Virgil van Dijk's had an absolute lovely game, Alice 
Welsh and Becca's mm. there, we'll be fine. Where I was really nervous. Um, I think a lot of people were just more calm and the expectation was we'll just win. The context is important, I think, for this, Dan. And it's a shame because it is a derby. Yeah. But also, I think, pe- I think people, people go, people talk about the Anfield atmosphere, like it's this uniform thing and then when it's not like the best of the best of the best it's they go oh well, it's, not, it's obviously there for a myth which is fucking horseshit it's absolutely fucking horseshit there's obviously games where it's better than yeah. better than others my contention is the worst atmosphere at Anfield is better than 95 percent of the atmospheres prior to Jürgen clock coming in mm-hmm. and a lot of that comes from the cop just basically being standing it's been almost people have stood almost exclusively for every game more and more it wasn't totally like that in the early years but I think Chloe's point this season we tried we, we were going for top four that's when everyone started to stand up yeah. more at the start of the season not so much yeah. but halfway through that when there was something to fight for that's mm. when everyone I remember stood. people that Middlesbrough game guys, yeah. a guy kicking off by me because there's people around me wanted to sit down and he was mm-hmm. going oh, fucking stand up and that, that mm. I haven't seen anything remotely no. like that for years but the context of the game we have this when you play teams where you don't they don't have the ball well normally what happens when you sing you'll sing a song and if the song lulls you'll just boo when the opponents have got the ball and then that'll give you a chance to catch yourself and then <clears> sing another song. When they've not got the ball, you can't boo, so you can't you can't generate that noise. And, Cody's about that that weight of expectation, if it's nil-nil, it was a little nervy, a little edgy, and I think the crowd got a little bit like that, but that gets forgotten. Game state is important. It isn't It isn't blanket noise from start to finish in, in lots of games of football. No, it's not, of course it's not. It wasn't exactly the blood and thunder of a derby that we've seen yeah. in the past either, was yeah. it? In the, the half twelve kickoff plays into that, of course it does. After international break, maybe a little bit as well. But I think personally I've been to loads of games at Anfield, of course, but I think the expectation of what's going on in the game and sort of what's happening in front of you does sort of play into the atmosphere massively so and if there ever, ever is a sense of jeopardy, regardless of the opposition at Anfield, I feel that like we do go again and we can rouse the players. I remember being at a West Ham game. I think Pablo Four Niles give them the lead, and all of a sudden, Anfield was not quite Barcelona levels in terms of that night, but it wasn't too far behind. So, the opposition and who we're playing against is a factor. But if Liverpool are in jeopardy and Liverpool might drop points, we go again. Anfield yeah. can, like, they rouse itself up until that point. But for me, it frustrates the life out of me when Brentford clutching a team from thin air come and say where's your atmosphere it's like I'm not being funny lads but you're, you're Brentford you? yeah like literally with all due respect but don't get me wrong if you go 1-0 up yeah. then then you'll see you yeah. know what I mean but when it's 1-0 2-0 to Liverpool and we're just coasting and they're expecting this roar because Anfield's like come on what do you fo- think like? it is it is like football entitlements is that you're describing almost because I agree with this is that like we don't if there's a club that we feel that we we want to knock down a peg or we, we, we need to really fight it's like you've made to the top of the mountain you're like the, the aged heavyweight if you know you if you know you're going to pummel your opponent, you don't showboat it. You get it done and you get and you get yeah. off, don't you? But if someone lands lands a blow, oh fuck me, right? I'm sorry. This is where I'm bringing out all my all 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 of what I've got. And so you're right. You've got your, your Brentford. I would, Southampton's always my example of this, but Brentford, Southampton, Fulham's these bunch of teams who are. I don't. I, I wouldn't want to be like ah in your face and all this kind of yeah. give them loads of shit because. The middle of the road football team. No, I know, like, and yeah. it's and again, that's that's a, a it's a cockiness or an arrogance. I don't know, but that's that that's how it is. That's how it's always been for me when you when we've played those teams. But the difference is, from my experience of going to Anfield, people talk about the atmosphere now. Those atmospheres are still miles better than the ever were anything I went to. In talking about like the yellows and the reds. I went back as the one that stands in my mind was Les Ferdinand being sent off a QPR against us and I remember being at that game. I went back and looked at it. For a start, there were two reds in that game, which I'd forgotten the other one. 23,000 people were at Anfield for that game. It was a midweek game against QPR. Twenty. Can you imagine half? It doesn't doesn't happen. So this notion that somehow atmospheres were brilliant in the past and now they're not is nonsense it's it's absolute and total utter bollocks we for those games that we're talking about the ones that aren't we've got loads of expectation on them we never even used to fill off the ground let alone create an atmosphere you know i, I used to sit and sit with my dad in those seats up in, in the in the upper centenary and i would know all the opponents chance because you'd hear them all game long you know i find myself like humming along to them and not realizing i was doing it so yeah i, I know i've seen a lot of people talking about it but it's I'm not saying that was the best atmosphere I've ever been involved in, but the idea that there's any issue with the atmosphere at Anfield horseshit, like the, total horseshit. The atmosphere at Anfield might be different to everywhere else because it's very much like 
when the the players need us, that's when we show up. Oh, but if we, yeah, 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 if we think they're fine and you know the, the, the Sarni don't need us, then yeah, we'll sing our tunes, but we won't go all out. Leicester is another one. It's it was they literally their fans gave us something to get angry at and they gave us something and when you give Anfield something and you piss them off we will wake up and we will and I didn't care what you say James Madison turned around and said Anfield's the best atmosphere I've ever played and he's he's he pl- Everybody does. They now. always do. There Everybody is, does. Exactly. The, there's no way these footballers who play all around the world in all different stadiums with all sets of fans, including international fans, where fans of Chelsea and fans of Arsenal all fa- all still go like enjoy England. Like, there's no way that these footballers are saying, "Oh my God, Anfield, it's an inc- like the atmosphere." You don't say it for no reason. Every great player. Of the last two, you know, twenty years, yeah. every great manager of the last twenty years all talk about it, and there's a lot of times in that period where Liverpool weren't great yeah. either, to be honest. But you're right; it's one of those. I've seen someone saying, like, you know, there's fans of of lower league teams and they have consistently great atmospheres, and they do, but they've got a smaller fan base and a more dedicated fan base in that. If Anfield was a was a quarter of the size and it was filled only with a, a, a still an outnumbering force of absolute diehards, the diehard of the diehard of Liverpool fans, it would be that. And I. Agree there's a dilution the bigger the ground gets when it's best at its best it can be better than it's ever been because if you can get 63,000 people or 61,000 people when it's finally done singing from the same hinge sheet then that's going to be absolutely something else um but yeah I just the other thing is we're in that weird part of the season aren't we obviously the expectation everything that you've spoken about there was I think absolutely spot on to be honest but we're, we're in that sort of crossover period with the team whereby we haven't got a Bobby Firmino song that we can sing anymore. There's no Sadio Mane song. Yeah. You know, Jürgen's asked us to stop singing I <laughs> Feel song, Fine yeah. until the, until after the game or the very end of the game. The Jota one's the only one that's sort of yeah. relevant yeah. at the moment that gets the ground going. And Ale, 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 I don't know about you, I've always felt a bit weird singing it and not on European nights. Yeah. Never used to at the beginning, but yeah. there was a turning point, I don't know when, when it became a European champ for me. Um and, and so I think we're waiting for those that big sob a slide chance or a moment from one of these players for us to be able to find this season's groove in terms yeah. of the songbook. That's right. The so Liverpool have got a huge songbook of songs, but you're right. When they go back to the base level ones, which is Fields of Anfield Road and Poor Scouts and Tommy and the countless variations on chanting Liverpool, um, they're fine, they're all there, everyone knows them, but they're not the ones I mean, Fields of Anfield Road can be Massive when it wants to be, and obviously LA's got it got its place. But you're dead right. You know, in our two or three years ago, you could rattle through half the players on the team at the at one, and they would all be to equal place. We haven't even got Andy Robertson on the pitch. You know what I mean? Like so, like this the one that he would have been like six or seventh down the pecking order for it. I don't think this Trent Alexander Arnold one's very good, so that's not one that really catches catches fire. Van Dyke's a centre half when their when their team does. Not and you're not singing your song about your your centre back, are you? And you're right. So this is our like the transition period out where Sobers is going to get one at some point. You know, Nunes has got a chance. He'll get a chance. At, he'll get a proper song at some point, and then we'll have we'll have tons. Of the, um, I think it's a really good point. The thing is, is also we're in that position where we don't like. I think we're all hoping to be in a title race, yeah. but you can't say that you're in it. Yeah. And once it actually comes down to every single point matters because you know you're in that title race. At some point around Christmas, it'll switch if Liverpool are still up with Manchester yeah. City yeah. and it'll be, lads, we cannot, we've got to make this a cacophony of noise. You've got to make it a fortress. You can't, no matter if it's Brentford, if it's Fulham, if it's City, if it's United, every single game... The, the lads are going to need us and at nil nil we're going to scream and we're going to sing and we're going to chant and it's all because there's something to lose there's something on the line there and right now I don't I think we're in the in the middle of are we in a title race could we be in a title yeah. race but actually you know what are we doing we, we don't have a DM and out now DM can this ta- like there's a lot of people who didn't expect Liverpool to be where they are right now a lot of our fans don't expect didn't expect us to be in a title race and once we finally understand how where everyone is closer to Christmas that's when you'll realise if Anfield has a sniff that we might have a chance at a title oh my god move out the way because you don't want to be in, a, the in, the, in the stadium it's the building blocks of the season isn't it absolute building blocks Um 
Right, shout out. Uh, come and join us for more chat. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, the Bias Football Podcast pretty much about 10 minutes after this one finishes over on Redmen Plus. Dot com, uh, which promises to be very good fun indeed. There is a code. Is the code biased? Yes. Yes. How do you spell that? B I A S E D. B I A S E D. Uh, to get half price uh, subscription for two months. Head over there, choose a captain uh, monthly subscription and get it half price for two months using the code BIAS. Uh, we're going to be looking at next week's round of fixtures, the 10 game threshold, and making predictions for what the league's going to look like. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Chelsea Arsenal game uh, and just some of the hilariousness that happened around that. Rotating your goalkeepers, Mikel Arteta. Good work. Um, <laughs> and a few other bits and pieces as well. So do come and join us on the Bias Football Podcast. Promise to be a good laugh. And we'll see you over on redmanplus.com. Have a boss Monday. ta Thank you so very, very much for checking out the video. If you enjoyed it, drop a like. Uh, the season is now well underway. If you need extra Red Men content, be it podcasts, videos, documentaries, interviews, and general shows, fill your boots on redmenplus.com today. <laughs>